Hello, I think we're live. Welcome, everyone. Uh, feel free to say hi in the chat. Hope everyone's having a good weekend. Um, and yeah, enjoying the summer at the moment. Um, it'll be great to hear from you throughout the session. So do feel free to say hi if you can hear me and in the chat as well. That'd be great to see um, messages coming through and so on. So um, yeah, it'd be great to hear from you. Uh, we're going to be looking at calculus today. So this will be. Um, differentiation we're going to look at the chain rule um i've got the chat here hi yeah what well, good thanks hopefully you can hear me okay good to hear from you uh, i hope you're all well um too and everyone's doing okay we're going to be looking at chain rule which is a big part of um differentiation a huge part of calculus that's typically covered in year 13 it's a big important part of the a level uh yeah a happy sunday i hope you're all having a good day uh and it'd be lovely to hear um, from you guys in the chat with questions and answers as we go. So I'm going to get started straight away so that we can get on with quite a big topic here. We're going to be looking at chain rule. Um, so I'm going to share the PowerPoint now and hopefully this will be full screen for everyone um, and we'll get cracking with this. So um, welcome if you've just joined. I hope everyone's keeping well. And as I said, we're going to look at chain rule today, which is a massive A-level topic, part of the pure maths, part of the calculus. Welcome, lovely to see so many people joining as well. Do feel free to say hello and ask any questions or share any answers as we go um, today. So uh, let's get started. So we're going to look at chain rule. And um, I'm Max and I've been uh, teaching maths for a while now. So since I did my degree in maths, um, I've been teaching A-level GCSE and Key Stage maths. Head of maths at Snap Revised, and um, I've been teaching A level maths for about five, six years now, uh, which has been an interesting time with the changes in exams and stuff. So, um, what we're going to do today is we're going to look specifically at this thing called the chain rule. Um, it'd be great. Hi, welcome. Lovely to hear from you. Um, great to see people putting comments and messages in the chat. Do let me know as well if you've done the chain rule before, if you've heard of it. Uh, it'd be good to get an idea of this if this is revision or if this is actually brand new for people. So let me know if you've seen this part. Hopefully we've seen maybe differentiation before, for those of you that have started your A-levels. Uh, yes, absolutely. Brilliant question. This is for a function of a function. So the chain rule, it's quite an involved process, uh, but it's pretty satisfying when you get your head around it because it looks quite complicated initially. Um, brilliant. Uh, so for some people, this is revision. Uh, but we're going to go from scratch, look at exam questions and so on as well. So that's great to hear. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so we're going to look at a method for differentiating powers of brackets. And then we're going to extend that into negative and fractional powers. And then we're going to even take the chain rule further and look at trig and exponential differentiation. Um, and just basically come up with a rule that works for all chains, all functions in functions, composite functions. I'm not going to do first principles today, and I'm not going to do graph sketching, uh, but I think this is a brilliant topic to recap. So what we've got to start with, just to kind of recap of prerequisite things we should hopefully know. So differentiating just an x to the power of n. Uh, do feel free to share answers, work ahead of me in the chat. But is everyone happy that we eff effectively multiply by the power and drop the power by one. And I'm hoping that that is basically a bit of revision, but just let me know yes or no if that's something you've covered. Lovely, brilliant. Um, and the same if there are multiple functions, alpha x to the n, when you differentiate that bit, it will become alpha times n x to the n minus one. And you'd effectively do the same to this function over here, and you times beta by m, and x would now be to the power of m minus one. And it's easier sometimes when we see it with numbers, but we're just sort of coming up with a general rule. These ones we need to treat uh, with a bit of caution. So those of you that have done this in year 12 will know that we probably want to use index laws firstly to write this as a power of x. So the nth root of x is x to the power of one over n, and one over x to the m can be written as x to the minus m. Okay, brilliant. Really well done and lovely to see comments coming through. Please do keep that up. Um, hopefully this is just generally revision, but we're going through kind of a few key ideas to get us started. So to now differentiate this, it's a bit more user-friendly. Same process, we times by the power and drop the power by one. 
So that would be one over n minus one. And then here, this would be um, you times by the power. So it would be minus, and it would be x to the minus n minus one, or effectively one over x to the m plus one. So if it was like to the minus four and it goes to the minus five, that's effectively happening in the denominator. So hopefully that's clear. Now you might have seen some exponential differentiation as well. This is covered in year 12, but it's worth knowing that that's the case. Um, and just a yes or a no, if you've seen trigonometric differentiation before, because this is often touched upon uh, at the start of year 13, depending on how your course is structured. Um, but basically sine differentiates to cosine. So this will become a cosine x, brilliant. Good, so it's lovely to hear. Some people are a bit familiar with this. We've done this previously in other videos. We've gone through this stuff, but I'm just sort of putting the key things we're gonna to need to call on for this. Lovely. Um, and then cos cosine actually differentiates, actually differentiates the minus sine x. So this is the sort of sneaky one. You've got to remember there's like a negative factor coming out. But yeah, again, the a or the constant will be part of it. Hi, uh, welcome if you've just joined, lovely to hear. Uh, people saying hello and joining and answering questions as well. So this is the kind of stuff we're going to need to be confident with moving forwards. But we're going to get straight on to the chain rule now and see how we go. So as I mentioned, whether you're doing your A-level with AQA, Edexcel or OCR, um, whatever example you're using, chain rule and calculus is crucial. It's a really important part of pure maths. And it is probably if you're doing anything maths based at university or in the future, knowing this part of calculus is going to be crucial. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by differentiating um, a couple of functions in the in the old fashioned way of year 12 style. How would you do it if it was a double or a triple bracket? And effectively, what we're going to do is we're just going to expand the bracket and do it sort of long ways uh, because it's not too bad. So that's a sneaky double bracket there. Is x plus three, x plus three. Hopefully everyone can see that. And we can expand that out. And effectively what we're being asked to differentiate is x squared plus three x plus three x to plus six x plus nine. Is everyone happy that that is the same question? I haven't actually done any differentiation yet. I've just written it in a, in a more obvious way. That's what it wants us to differentiate, super. So, Lovely. So if you're able to do that and you differentiate it, you'd go, right, that would become 2x and then plus 6x, that would go to plus 6. Now, what I really like that we've done, um, a couple of you have done this, this is superb. You've actually factorised the answer and that is perfect for looking at the chain rule, which we're going to do in a minute. So that's the derivatives there. That is the differentiation. But we can factorise that to that. And we're going to see how this relates to the chain rule in a minute. I know I did it a bit of a long winded way. It wasn't a particularly difficult one. Uh, let's do the same for this one here. So I'm just very quickly going to expand that triple bracket for you. Plus 12x squared minus 8. And if we differentiate that the old fashioned way, that would become 6x to the 5 minus 24x cubed plus 24 x now interestingly that brilliant that can actually be written if i break this up as three times two x times and it would actually factorize to this if i was to factorize that nicely okay and this that you wouldn't be expected to know easily that that factorizes like that but i'm going to show you now how that relates to the chain rule okay really really well done so you might have gone about this a bit differently um, and factorizing is brilliant because actually for harder parts of these a-level questions it's really useful if you're good at factorizing because if you're then asked to solve something and you've got it in a factorized form you're kind of laughing because you're ready to do the next bit of the question so in general what we've got here is is everyone happy that we've effectively got like a little function raised to a power so it's like a mini function within another function. Yeah. So x plus three is a little function of its own. It's a little linear function. And that scenario is being squared. x squared minus two is a function. It's a little quadratic function. And that function is being cubed. 
So it's a function in a function. And the way we differentiate these is basically you sort of differentiate around it. So like times by the power of the thing, drop that power by one, and then times it by this bit inside, differentiated. Now that notation often confuses people, but can you guys see that's effectively what we did here? So if I highlight it, it might make it clearer. For this question here, we've times by the two, and then effectively like differentiate around it, that's like to the power of one, and then of the thing, and the derivative of x plus three is just one, so that's your answer. And to be honest with you, using chain rule for that sort of question is a little bit overkill because you could have just done it how we did. But for this question, it made it so much easier because if you think about it, let's have a little look. This was like three times two X. What we've done is we've times by the three, drop the power to two of the thing, and then times by the derivative of the inside, which is two X. And what's really great about this is it's made the differentiation really easy, but it's also given the answer in a factorized form, which is way better than having it like this. Does that make sense to everyone? I know some of you that have seen this before, this might just be revision, um, but does everyone see what I'm talking about from this rule? So when it's a function in a to a power, a function in a function, you can sort of differentiate around it, then multiply by the derivative of the inside, Brilliant. And we're going to do plenty of practice of this and some exam questions as well. So let's have a little look. I'm going to move this on. Do feel free to ask or question or challenge anything we're not sure of. So sometimes seeing it written like this throws people off. They think that looks really confusing. But effectively, just think of it as differentiate around it times by the derivative of the inside. Um, so here, what we've got, yeah, it looks, it does look quite daunting, but if we break this one down, I think we'll do this one a little bit more explicitly. Let's think about this thing in here just being f of x, okay? Now off to the side, I could think, what's actually the derivative of that? How does cos, cos or cosine differentiate? Well, some of you have already said it. Is everyone happy that goes to minus sine of x? And e to the x differentiated just goes to e to the x. So we know how to differentiate that hard looking bit. Brilliant, yeah, superb suggestions. So that's effectively like the derivative of the inside, which we're gonna times by in a minute. Then all we literally do other than that is basically deal with the fact that it's a bracket squared. It's something to the power of two. So you're gonna bring that to the front and drop the power by one, just like you would with year 12 differentiation. So it'll be two cos x plus e to the x to the power of one. And effectively, you don't really need to write power of one because that's just what it is. Times by the derivative of the inside, this bit, which is just minus sine x plus e to the x. And that's all you do. And it is actually also factorized for you. So you don't have to give it more thought than it, it needs. Basically, times by the two of that thing to the one, times by the derivative of the inside, which we just worked out to the, off to the side already, is this thing. And that's it, it's all done. So we'll do the same again for the next one. But of course that does just, if you sort of step back and look at that, it does look kind of confusing, but actually it's followed a really simple process. So if you prefer to write this the way around that we did it, n times f of x to the n minus one, then times the derivative of the inside, that might make more, I've just written it the other order. But that's effectively what we did. We sort of differentiated around it with the two coming down, power of one, and then just multiplied it by the derivative of what was in the inside function. So if we do the same here, we think of this bit as f of x. So I'm going to say this is f of x, and I'm actually going to rewrite it as x to the half minus x to the minus one is the, is the inside bracket. Is everyone happy how that differentiates? So that inside bit would differentiate to, we worked it out. Sorry, my pen's gone a bit, let me try it again. Half X to the minus a half. And then that would be minus X to the minus two. Okay, 
And then all we do is that same rule again. So the three comes down out the front. Then we can write what it is in the brackets. And then hopefully we're happy the power drops to two. So that's the year 12 style bit. Three of the thing to the power of two. But we just need to remember to times by the derivative of this, which we've just worked out up here. So that's one over two root X is how you could write that bit minus, and that's the same as one over X squared. And so there's, there's different ways that is the same as that. I've just written it um, plus X minus two instead. Let me have a little look. Sorry, well spotted. You're absolutely right. That should, yeah, really, really well spotted. That should be a plus. Excellent, Louise. Thank you for spotting that. That should have been positive because the minus minus really well done. You spotted my intentional mistake. I was trying to make sure everyone was paying attention. No, well done. That was really good. The minus cancels out and becomes a plus. Very good. Does everyone see that? It was really well spotted in uh, the comment there. Uh, but the process there, I think we were all following, hopefully, of times by the three, drop the power by two, multiply by the derivative of the inside. But really, really well done. Um, if you followed that. If anyone else has any questions, if they want to check anything, um, they want me to re-explain anything, please let me know in the chat. Um, I'm more than happy to go back or re-talk through it. So that'll be fine. Um, otherwise, we can move on. Um, and I'll let you think about these next couple, which we're going to work through. Um, but that is that is really, that sort of sums up the chain rule when it's something to a power. Um, Right, brilliant question. When do we use natural logs? Again, that applies to the chain rule, but you might be asked to do ln of some other function, in which case you differentiate around it and go from there. So you also have logs coming up in integration as well. Um, but we'll hopefully see that in a few examples later. We'll see how we go. But brilliant question. Learn or ln could be used in chain rule um, as maybe the outside function. So here we've got another scenario now where actually this one maybe is less obvious as a chain. But actually what you could do is it could actually be two separate chain rules. So sec, if you've come across this before, does anyone know what sec is as a function? Sec of x. This is a special type of trig function you see in year 13. Um, it's called a reciprocal trig function. Does anyone know what sec is? Brilliant, well done. This is one over cos. It's cos x to the minus one. So you could write one over cos. That doesn't particularly help us with what we're trying to do. But it's one over cos, which is effectively cos of x to the power of minus one. Not inverse cos, not arc cos, but actually one over the function cos. So that's the same as cos x to the power of minus one, aka we call that sec x. Well done, well done if you knew that. This one here is also a chain because hopefully everyone's happy that that's e to the x to the half. Whenever you square root something, it's the same as raising it to the power of a half. So this is, I haven't actually done any differentiation here. I've just written this in a more sort of user-friendly form whereby we can see there's actually two little chain rules going on. So because we've got cos x to the minus one, it's now possible to differentiate that by the chain rule in that we can bring the minus one to the front, drop the power to minus two, and times by the derivative of the inside. And that would be how you differentiate sec. Um, so let's have a little look. So what we'd get is we'd get minus one, lots of cos x to the minus two, multiplied by the inside, differentiated. So can anyone remind me what cos x differentiates to? And this is why we sort of need to keep aware of all these different things. What does cos x, cosine of x, differentiate to? Um, so minus one cos x to the minus two times by the derivative of cos x, brilliant, which is minus sine x, super. And we can tidy that up in a minute. Well done. And what about e to the x to the half? What do we reckon here? So we're gonna, for this bit, times by the power, the minus half times by the derivative of e to the x, which is actually e to the x. Now it's just a case of tidying this up. 
So the minus and the minus cancel here, and you get sine x, and then that would be cos x to the minus 2, which interestingly is the same as over cos squared x. That's all of that bit tidied up. And this bit here becomes half e to the x times 1 over root e to the x, or e to the x to the half. And when you combine that, that just becomes e to the x to the half, or root e to the x. Any questions, let me know. Um, we could go even further with this, because sine over cos squared, well, what is sine over cos the same as? Does anyone know from your trig identities? Sine over cos, because this is basically sine over cos and another cos on the bottom as well. So sine over cos times one over cos. Well, sine over cos is the same as what? What is sine over cos? Brilliant, it's tan of x. And another one over cos is another sec of x. So that's often the way we write the derivative of sec x. Tan x sec x is the derivative. So these aren't obvious, like unless you go through a process, I mean, you might be given them in a formula book that sec differentiates to tan x sec x, but you wouldn't go, oh yeah, obviously I just knew that. Um, unless you've been through this process at some point and you recognize it as one of those things that is, is a case you could learn, but it comes from going through the chain rule. So um, well done if you noticed that. Yeah, any questions on there? Because that was quite an involved one. So if you'd like to check anything, um, please let me know. Otherwise, we can look at this one here, which does look a little bit nasty. Um, but yeah, any questions? Because there was effectively two separate chain rules there. There was the bit for sec where you had to deal with the reciprocal trig. And then we had to deal with e to the x as like rooted as e to the x to the power of a half. So well done if you followed that. Let's try this one now. Any suggestions on here? How we could deal with this whole scenario of one over the cube root? Because I think that's what's making it particularly nasty looking. Um, one over the cube root of something. How could we deal with that maybe as a power? How could we turn this into a chain rule? One over the cube root of x cubed minus 4x. Now, you might be looking at that thinking, oh, no, that looks disgusting. That looks really hard. What do I do? Uh, very close. Yeah, it's a negative power. A brilliant suggestion. Um, yes. Yeah, I think we're all on the right lines here. Hopefully, we can see that a way we could rewrite this question is it's like x cubed minus 4x. That's the sort of inside function. But that is like to the power of, let's be careful, it's negative because it's on the denominator, minus a third because it's the cube root. Can everyone confirm they're happy with that? Just a yes or a no, if that makes sense. Yeah? And it's not obvious straight away. When you first look at that, you probably think, oh, no, this is not my favorite question. But when you see it, then actually suddenly the whole question becomes a lot easier to visualize. And then you can go, right, I know what this is now. This is a chain rule. It's a something to the power of minus a third. Well, I know how to get started. Minus a third comes down. I drop the power by one. Then I times by the derivative of the inside. Yeah, and you have to see sort of a flavor of different questions, like a variety of different questions to really go, OK, actually, I could change how this is written and it's not that bad. Very good. Excellent responses there. So what we've got is if I times by minus a third of the thing that we're dealing with, and then be careful here with the negative fractional powers, take one off, you'd have the power of minus four thirds because it's like taking three thirds off effectively when we're talking, taking off one, um, times by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of that inside is not that bad, actually. X cubed differentiates to three X squared and minus four X differentiates to minus four. That's done, you've done it. No, it wasn't as, as daunting as it first looked. That is it, all factorized. I mean, it's not the easiest looking type of function answer, but 
you've done it you've differentiated that thing and that's all done for you so let me know if that um sort of makes sense and if you're happy with that but really well done superb responses um and what we'll do we'll just do a little checkpoint if you could just give me a one two or a three on how you feel with that just be honest and uh, be good to get a little checkpoint and then we'll do a couple of exam questions so let me know how you're feeling with that and then we'll see it in the context of an exam question super right Cool. OK, so, yeah, just a one, two or a three. Excellent. And thank you for um, the comments, the questions and answers as we've gone there. Let's look at this next one now. So this question here, superb. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the responses there. Um, what we've got is we've got find the value of dy dx at the point where x equals two on the curve with that equation. I would also just like to say, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, like even the class is, you can actually fully do this question on the calculator. Does everyone know how to do that on the class with calculator? You can differentiate and find the value at a single point, which is superb for checking. Do you guys know how to do that? So one of the buttons, one of the settings on the calculator allows you to differentiate at a point and it will give you the answer exactly. Obviously, it won't get you the full marks for this question, but it's a really good safety net, of, safety net rather of being able to check your answers. So I can let you know how to do that in a minute if you'd like to, but also we need to know how to do it sort of long ways and properly as well. Um, so just be aware, this is one you could check um, on the calculator. Cool. So let's do this. What we're going to do is hopefully everyone recognises that actually this is a chain and a product. So you've got an x squared and you've also got a root. I'm actually gonna show you a little sneaky trick with this question where it doesn't have to be a chain and a product. There's a sneaky way of turning this into one single chain. And it's something that at A level, I'll be honest, I wouldn't have probably spotted. But I'm gonna show you how to do it and please do ask if you're not sure. Does everyone see that if this is x squared times the square root of something, what we could do is if there's ever anything on the outside of the square root, we can square it and bring it into the root. So I could write this function as follows. I could bring the x squared in as an x to the four. Really sneaky trick. I don't think I would have spotted, to be honest during maybe year 12 and certainly maybe year 13 even. Um, and I can write this function as a single square root, five X to the five minus X to the four. Now I'm gonna just pause there because some people might think, hang on, obviously don't, this has just totally gone off piece. It's just done something completely different. I haven't differentiated it yet. You could absolutely do chain and product, do the whole long winded thing and tidy it up. But what I wanted to say is everyone happy that this function can actually be written like this. Yeah, it does make it a lot easier. So if you've got a number on the outside of a third, a square root, you can bring it into the root by squaring it. Like if you had four root five, you can turn that into root 16 times five and put it, oops, and put it all in the square root. And that's effectively what we've done. Yes, you, you can. You can use product rule and chain rule together. But what I'm saying is by rewriting this question like this, you don't have to then do that. You can just use product uh, chain rule. So I've made the question a bit easier just by tweaking what they've written. But again, you might not have spotted that you could do that. You would still get the same answer if you do it properly. But I just want to check everyone's happy how I've got to there before I differentiate it. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's not cheating. You've made the question more user-friendly. In a way, it's like um, if you get given a thing like this and you turn it into x to the power of a fifth, you've kind of had to go through that process in order to get you to differentiate it anyway. So you wouldn't lose marks. Actually, that's what, this is a really cool, clever little way of doing this one. Um, yes, absolutely. Brilliant questions, guys. So there's nothing wrong with it. It's actually a really good way of dealing with these questions. 
if it's something where you can get it all into a square room, sometimes you can't. But if it is and you do that and it makes the differentiation easier, brilliant. You'll get all the marks. That's absolutely fine. It just makes it easier for you. So this is something a lot of people wouldn't spot that they could do, which is why I think it's a really good one to go through, because now it is just one straightforward chain rule. So let's think this is basically 5x to the 5 minus x to the 4 all to the power of a half. Is everyone happy with that? Before we even differentiate, that's what effectively we're dealing with. Now it's so much easier to differentiate. So feel free to give it a go. Uh, and then we've got a bit further to go with this question as well. Let's see what we get. So what's dy dx? What's the derivative of this going to be? Let's have a little look. So I'm going to times by the power of a half of the thing to the minus a half, so I've dropped the power by one, times the derivative of the inside, 5x to the 5 would differentiate to 25x to the 4 minus 4x cubed. OK. And then what I'm doing now, what I'm doing now is I'm just subbing 2 in, let x equal 2, and see what we get. Is that okay? So you sub two in as x. Um, and so we're going to let x equal two. And you go a half times two to the five minus two to the four to the minus half. You could have tidied up how this was written, but effectively this will work. Hopefully. What you come out with that comes out as 400 minus 32 over 2. I believe we get 46 over 3. Do check, do check, you get the same. Does everyone know how to do this on a calculator without having to go through all these steps where you literally type in the original question and it differentiates it for you and puts two in? Do we all know how to do that? No, would you like me to, does have, do you guys have the class whiz calculator? Have you guys been using that one? So there's that one, there's, there's the white back class whiz calculator. There are other ones like the CG50, but some of the ones you're allowed do the differentiation for you. So Louisa, if you've got that, I'll, I'll talk you through how you can do this. Um, so if, for example, you're using the class whiz, um, those of you that maybe have access to this here, you can have a little look. I'll just explain it quickly because it's brilliant for checking your answers. Do you see underneath the menu setup button, there's like a little integral button with a, a D, DX in yellow. And if you press shift, it gives you the derivative symbol. Um, and so then you can type the original question in using the X button underneath on, and you can type X squared, square root button, 5x minus 1. And then you use the arrows to go along and press x equals 2. And it literally does the whole differentiation for you and puts 2 into it and gives you the answer. And it gives it a 15.3 recurring. But that is equivalent. So it's just really good for checking your answers, which is amazing. Like I didn't know for ages that this did it. Um, I think it varies. It's, it's a, you're able to get this online, but it is allowed for the exams. So it's just handy to know for those that have it. Obviously, whilst it's people think that's great, that will do it, you won't get all the marks for just typing it in. You have to know how to do this process. I'm just saying if you do have that calculator or any calculator you do have, make sure you know little checking mechanisms that will allow you to check it for the exam. Yeah, I think it's available online quite easily. They're, they're kind of quite widely used now for a lot of the exams. So well done. Uh, but either way, whatever calculator you're using, make sure you're using it efficiently to check because um, it's a bit of a confidence boost as well as you're going through an exam. So this next one, this is an interesting question because a big chunk of it, this first bit, isn't even differentiation. It's just getting it as a single fraction. So I'm going to whiz through this one now um, and see how we go. Um, so the way to do this is remember single fractions, you need a common denominator. So is everyone happy that this 
one here needs to be times by 2x minus 1 over 2x minus 1. So that needs to, and you've effectively times by 1 in a clever way. Do we see that? Yeah, so very like those algebra topics you see. Uh, and then on the top, we're just minus in three because that's already over the common denominator. Superb. So what we can do is we can expand the top bit, see what we get. I'm just going to do this quite quickly for us, but do feel free to screenshot, to ask any questions, to check as we go, so that we can get on to the differentiation part of this. Um, so it's asking for it in its simplest form. Now on the top, that would tidy up to 8x squared minus 6x minus 2. That actually fully factorizes quite nicely. And actually for, for fractions, and it's some of you have mentioned partial fractions, you've seen this sort of stuff before. What you should really aim to do is try not to um, expand the denominator. Like if possible, we're trying to cancel things at the end. Um, so maybe like expand and then refactorize the top. Superb. Some of you are working way ahead of me here. Um, it's lovely to see. And thank you again to everyone for the comments and questions today. And um, this is a big full on topic, but a really good one to sort of stay um, refreshed with. So the twos will cancel. Um, and then actually what we've got on the top, the top bit does factorize again. So 4x plus one. And again, having little calculator tips and tricks for helping you towards things like factorizing can be really handy. So it's good doing this practice. And then actually that will cancel with that. And we end up with 4x plus 1 over 2x minus 1. So basically what we've learned is this question is a really complicated way of writing this thing here. So often for these calculus questions, part A will be a fractions problem where you tidy it up to a much nicer thing. And then it says, right, now differentiate it or integrate it. And then you can go, right, I've got a much easier version of it now I can use. So I know I can write all of this mess as this. Much easier to deal with. Right, so let's have a little look. Let's see how we go. Let's see what it wants us to do. Because it's starting to look like um, a quotient. Um, but I'm going to show you where we can go with this. So then part B of the question, well, we've just learned that this bit can be written as 4x plus 1 over 2x minus 1. But very good suggestion. It did look like a quotient rule. I think we're going to dodge the quotient rule today, uh, but we'll see how we go. Now there's also a minus 2. And part B is further algebraic manipulation. It's saying show that we can write it like this. So I like that you're anticipating we might need another rule, uh, but let's see where the question's taking us. So what we've got is for part B here, um, four, we know that first bit is 4x plus 1 over 2x minus 1 because we just dealt with that in part A, and we're minusing 2. Now, is everyone happy that if we're minusing 2, that's the same as minusing 2 lots of 2x minus 1 over 2x minus 1. Yeah? Because we, we're times in by the common denominator again, and we're writing that's effectively 1 written in a complicated way. Because now we can absorb that in, and we can tidy up the top bit. Yeah, you guys can see it. Well done. And now we're actually going to be able to dodge using the quotient rule because this one is where, where we're at. And now if we want to differentiate it and sub in two, we want to differentiate this function. All we need to do is go, right, this can be written as three. Brilliant, guys. You've been really um, quick to spot things today because we've, we've whizzed into like lots of different topics as well. Is everyone happy that that can be written as that? And that is now a bit more of an obvious chain. Yeah. And we're doing so well with these. This is brilliant. Lovely. So times by the power. Drop the power by one. Times by the derivative of the inside, which is just two. So effectively, that differentiates to minus six. And you can actually write it as 2x minus one 
squared on the denominator is the power of two. And what do we also have to sub in? We have to sub in two as if it was x and see what that would spit out. So it'd be minus six over two times two minus one squared. So that would be excellent. And then that comes out as uh, minus two thirds, I think. Well done, well done if you spotted to sub in two and that's your number, your numerical answer you'd evaluate. So really, really well done there. Yes, good. Oh yeah, I've just seen the comments. Well corrected and well spotted. That was good. Um, brilliant. So that was great. I think that tidies up nicely to that. We're going to keep going because I think we've hit some really big bits of um, differentiation by chain rule now. Um, and I'm just going to give a kind of further scenario where they're starting to look a lot harder. So we've been doing where it's a function to a power of a number. Now we're going to look really explicitly if it's a function within a function. And what we still effectively do is we differentiate around the inner function and then times by the derivative of the inside. And that is actually what we've been doing the whole time. It's just the outermost function has been bring a number down, drop the power by one. OK, so superb. I'm really glad and we're good with that. Now, here, what we've got, and this is where I want to sort of, we've got to almost zoom your brain out a bit and think sine x to the n, what does that mean? Well, it's a something to the n, and that something is a function, it's sine. So is everyone happy that the sort of outside function is x to the n, it's something, this thing to the n, and if you differentiated it, it would be this. Is everyone happy with that concept? Yeah. So the f of x function is raising something to the n. The inside function, the sort of the g function, the thing that's going on inside is sine x is the thing that's going in. And so that would differentiate to, what does that differentiate to, to cos x? Yeah, so bear with it. I know that some of you are thinking maybe, but why is it x to the n? Um, it's not necessarily x. But the point is, it's something to the n. It's whatever this is to the n. That's what the outside scenario is. Yeah. So I know that might have been confusing how that's written, but it's just to get the process in the right order. So the way you differentiate this is you go, right, something to the n. Well, that something is sine x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to times by the power drop the power by one, and times by the derivative of the inside, which is cos x. Is that okay? And great, excellent comments, guys, excellent questions and answers. Yes, good, so that kind of x, if you'd rather, I mean, you could even put it in a different color to go, it's a, it's a space filler, isn't it? It's like a, okay, it's not x, it's something to the n, that's the point. The outermost function is a mm, to the n, yeah, good. Right, so um, just little things for us to remember then. So like this one here, e to the ax plus b, well, e to the anything goes to e to the anything, but the inside function is actually the ax plus b. So when you times by the derivative of the inside, you're actually timesing it by a. Does that make sense? So in a similar way here, the outside function is sine. So that goes to cos of the thing times by the derivative of the inside, which is a. So here, outside function is cos, inside function is this. So differentiating the outside goes to minus sine of the thing times by the derivative of the inside, which is a. Okay. Brilliant. And that's why we're not calling it X, but we're thinking something. Yeah. Right. And we'll see with a few more examples now. Right. Let's have a little look. So I'm going to move this on. But these are really the chain rule questions. I think it's brilliant for us to practice. So let's have a little look. This next one. Right. So can anyone tell me if, if we're dealing with this scenario here? This is really good. And this is a full on kind of tricky A level question now. If we're doing f of g of x, what's the outside function in this scenario? What's the outermost function? What's the effectively f of x function? 
what have we got? <laughs> Excellent, that's lovely to hear. Thank you. Excellent. So the outside function f of x um, in this scenario, is everyone happy, is cos of, and I'm going to just write x. Okay, and if it helps, let's give it a green capital X. Cos of something is the outside function. So the derivative of cos, if everyone can remember, hopefully, um, is minus sine of the thing. Yeah, well done. And now the inside function, the g of x, the innermost function, really well done if you've spotted this already, is 3x cubed minus 2. Because it's basically a cubic function that's been put into a trig function. So on the outside, it's a trig thing. But within that, the mechanics of what's going on in there is this whole other cubic. So the inside function differentiated would become 9x squared. Yeah. Now, what we do is we basically just use that rule and we go, right. So the derivative here then is the outside thing differentiates to minus sine of what was ever was in there. So that's effectively like this bit dealt with. Then we need to times by the derivative of the inside, which is 9x squared. So our answer is minus 9x squared sine of 3x cubed minus 2. Does that make sense to everyone? And do feel free to ask if there's anything you want to check. Oh, yeah, yeah. Minus 9x, but yeah, lovely. Really, really good. Cool. That was good. And when you look at that, that's quite satisfying when you get the answer to something like that, because you've differentiated a composite function that involves trig, that involves a cubic. But actually, if you follow this procedure, it's not too bad to go through and get an answer quite quickly. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm glad this is making sense. But as I said, do ask. If at any point there's a bit you want to check. This one actually looks quite tough. This doesn't look like the nicest question. Let's break it down in the same way. So let's first of all think f of x and f dash of x. And then let's think what's the inside function and what's its derivative. Okay, and this might be a little bit nasty, this one. Totally worth going through though. So is everyone happy that zooming out ultimately? The outside scenario is when we first look at this, it's an exponential. It's an e to the something. So let's say f of x is an e to the something. Yes, very good. So the derivative of an e to the something is actually an e to the something. So we know e to that thing is going to be part of the answer. Now the inside function is the nasty bit, isn't it? It's basically x squared minus, and I'm actually going to write this as x to the minus a half. Mm, yeah. Now, when you differentiate that, you get a 2x. And here, I'm not going to make the same mistake, am I? <laughs> it's a plus, isn't it? It's going to be a plus x to the minus 3 over 2. And it's already starting to look like, oh, no, this doesn't look nice. It's fine. Now let's just put it all back in that rule. So all the rule said was the derivative of the thing, which would actually be e to the x squared minus 1 over root x. That is the derivative of the thing. Times by the inside bit differentiated. Which is fine. So that would be. And I've actually forgotten a half, haven't I? That should have come out. Yes, well done. I knew I wasn't going to get away with that. I shouldn't because it was wrong. Um, so well done. And sometimes doing that in a couple of steps, you then spot, oh, I've missed something here. X to the minus three over two. Well done. And that's quite <laughs> convinced me that everyone's following well because that was well spotted. So it doesn't look like a nice answer. 
but it wasn't a nice question and at the same time didn't take any longer the mistake was i forgot to times by the like the half i got the minus right this time but remember your times in the half down and dropping the power so it would have gone to plus a half x to the minus three over two and i just put plus x to the minus three over two so i forgot the fraction bit from the power that should have come down i amended the power correctly but i forgot there was a half um, but sometimes when you're going through it and you're checking the last steps, you do sort of see by looking back, it does sort of jog your memory. So well done if you noticed that. Uh, the process was insane, though. So it didn't take particularly much longer. There were more places you could probably get it wrong, the minus signs, the fractions. Uh, but if you lay it out in this way, it's actually OK. So it was a really good question to go through. Let's do one uh, other one like this and then we'll do a little checkpoint. Uh, but really great work here today, guys. So again, let's lay this out in a really nice, clear way. What's the outside function? What's f of x? What's its derivative? And then what's the innermost function? What's g of x? And what's its derivative? So who can tell me what? When you zoom out, like mentally, you think, right, ultimately, what is this function? What am I dealing with here? Sine of root... And I suppose that could have an extra bracket around it that make it more obvious for me. Ultimately, it's sine. Yeah, it's sine of something. The fact that it's sine of something confusing, don't worry about for now. So we're going to think, right, the outer function is sine of whatever, which differentiates to what? Sine differentiates to cos of whatever cos of that thing okay now the inner function is this nastier looking thing make sure i get it right which i'm actually going to rewrite as very really well spotted um, it's going to be e to the minus x plus 4x i'm going to write to the half. Now, interestingly, this is another chain. So just differentiating the inside is a chain of its own. So there's like two little chains going on. So to, in order to differentiate this inside bit, you actually have to use a chain rule. And so that's why we have to be confident with a chain rule. So yeah, so this inside function getting differentiated would come to half e to the minus x plus 4x to the minus a half times by the inside bit differentiated. So the inside bit differentiated would be um, minus e to the minus x plus four. Is that all right? Um, which I think, yeah. Yeah, so now putting it all together, it's going to differentiate um, as cos of the thing that was in there, e to the minus x plus 4x, times by, now the, the first bit, or the derivative, the inside, all this bit here, e to the minus x, plus 4x to the minus half. Now, I'm just going to show you how else that can be written, but we've just followed the rule again, is that anything to the minus a half can actually go on the denominator as like that, um, and the two can come out as well. And then on the top is all the other stuff. So it's just cos of e to the minus x plus 4x. That's another way of writing it, but it's actually done correctly to there. Um, is that okay? Does that work well? So just a little checkpoint, guys, to let me know how you feel with that. I am conscious of the time, um, and I just sort of think um, really, really well done. But there's a few exam questions you could potentially try after this. I'm just a little bit mindful that um, we've done a lot there. So just a one, two, or three. Let me know how you're feeling, um, and then we'll go from there. Uh, is that okay? Yeah, let me know in the chat. Super. Really well done to all of you. It was lovely 
um, to see how you'd work through that. That was great. Um, brilliant. That's really reassuring. It was a hard topic. So don't worry if you're still a little bit unsure. Um, and then, yeah, excellent work. So there are a couple of other questions that you might want to screenshot um, and try in your own time. Um, so this one, this one, um, and this one as well. Um, but yeah, we've done a lot there. So we've looked at differentiating powers of brackets. We've extended that onto negative and fractional powers. And we've also used the chain rule um, for trig and exponential functions. So really, really well done. Um, but yeah, the, there's a lot of exam questions on this topic. As I said, it's a huge thing um, to go through. But if you've got any questions, you want me to go back at all, you want to double check it, let me know. Um, but again, just once again, thank you so much for all your hard work there. And it was lovely to see the questions and the comments coming in as we went through that. Um, I think you've all done really well with it. Um, is that okay? Any final questions, let me know. Um, but as I said, that was um, brilliant work and lovely uh, to hear from you all throughout. Um, keep well, enjoy the rest of your weekend and summer, and hopefully see you at a Snap Revised web class um, at some point soon. Really, really well done. Thank you, and I appreciate all the hard work, comments and questions as well from all of you guys. So lovely to see you all taking part there and um, hopefully see you at a web class soon. Really well done. Thanks again. And uh, yeah, keep well, guys. And um, yeah, hopefully see you at another web class. Well done with the chain rule. Cool. Excellent. No worries. Well done. Bye.